Welcome to another edition of Between Two Fars. I'm Warnicky Miller here again at NASA Langley Research Center, and we have been enjoying our time talking with Michael Mark, who is an amazing veteran procurement attorney with almost 40 years of experience, over 20 years of experience uh, working procurements for the Air Force, and last 19 plus years here mm -hmm. at Langley. And um, I just wanted Michael to share some of the stories that he's got about how attorneys can bring practical experience to R&D activities in a way that really helps the clients. Could you talk to us a little bit more about some of your experiences? Sure. When I, in the Air Force, I had the classic mad scientist example where um, I was at AFOSR and I had a scientist who was working on electron beams. And he was talking to me about it, and he says, but I have a problem. And I said, what's that? And he said, it's the atmosphere. And I said, the atmosphere, what's the problem? Well, the molecules of the air interact with my beam, and it spreads out, and it loses its impact. But I th I've got a solution. And I said, what's your solution? Lasers. Lasers? Yeah, I'm going to take an umpteen gigawatt laser, and I'm going to blast a hole in the atmosphere, and I'm going to fire my beam through the hole. And I said, let's think about that for a moment. There's this thing called the National Environmental Policy Act that requires us to think a little bit about these things before we act, because the air has some useful purposes like breathing. <laughs> and for him, it was just an impediment to get rid of it. And it reminded me of the, the Bugs Bunny cartoon with the Martian who was going to blow the earth up because it was in the way. So we were able eventually to get him where he wanted to be, but we needed to do some uh, environmental impact analysis <laughs> to make sure we weren't going to uh, otherwise make life miserable on this planet. I like how you're able to bring a, a national federal act into this conversation, which is really just a, a common sense check that right. was maybe needed. A lot of what lawyers do, and younger lawyers learn this, I think, fairly quickly, is lawyers exercise common sense because sometimes the scientists are so focused that you know, the atmosphere's in the way I know, get rid of it. And then I think, yeah, but I need to breathe it, too. Um, another more recent example here at NASA, we have the uh, navigation Doppler LiDAR, referred to as NDL. Um, Langley had a major part in that. As a matter of fact, uh, we are the technology, we have the license issued uh, for, for commercialization of that technology. Um, but it's a very high precision navigation la uh, thing for autonomous landers and it can distinguish between very small pebbles and small rocks and big rocks so that the lander will not land on the boulder, it will find the open area. Uh, it's very high speed, it's high precision um, and we are testing it. For example, there was an NRA award to a contractor to fly it on their rocket, which was going to come back down. Mm -hmm. And we were going to use this NDL system to control the landing. Um, it came down to us, uh, and the Patent Council, Robin Edwards, and I got the, the statement of work, and it read very much like a cooperative agreement. We're going to partner to do this, and we're going to provide this, and they're going to do that, and we're going to get together and do these things. And we said, well, this is a cooperative agreement. And the uh, technical person said, no. Uh, the headquarters has said, it's a, it's a contract. We have to make it a contract. So we had to sit down and say, OK, we've got to rewrite this statement of work so that it oh, doesn't wow. look like a cooperative agreement. And she and I spent a lot of time with the researchers doing that to get it to the point where, A, it would look like a contract, but B, it would still allow enough of that collaborative activity without triggering the provisions that would require it to be a cooperative agreement. And that took a little bit of writing and effort on our part. Uh, and eventually we were able to make that happen and the thing is now being uh, put together and, and assembled to put on the rocket uh, for the flight test. Almost uh, kind of trying to fit a round peg in a square hole right. a little bit. And, and sometimes we have to do that, particularly the headquarters very often wants these things to be contracts rather than cooperative agreements. And, but the document that comes through looks very much like a cooperative agreement and really should be. Uh, and I think part of that may be because the rules with cooperative agreements involve mm -hmm. a lot of cost sharing and sometimes that's not what's on the table. So we have to work with the researchers to understand what it is they want to do mm -hmm. and then try and make it happen um, in a way that will fulfill the legal requirements. Uh, another area we've been working in is uh, boron nitride nanotubes. Oh. We invented a technology along with the National Institutes of Aerospace, which is an institute here, a research institute, and the Department of Energy Jefferson Lab. 
where we uh, came up with a machine that will create boron nitride nanotubes that are very high quality. Now what do we use these nanotubes for? Well boron is a really good radiation mm -hmm. inhibitor and if we can create sheets of, of this we could line say a space capsule with that as opposed to say lead for long duration flight tests. Uh, for instance if you're going to go to Mars we have put um, dosimeters on the back shell of some of the Mars landers and you're getting like two-thirds to three-quarters of your radiation dose for life just mm. on the trip out. Okay. So we're trying to find ways to protect the astronauts from radiation. And these and tubes are a lot lighter than the lead? Much, much lighter. Okay. They're very light. Uh, you could line them with a sheet of that and it would work as well as a lot of lead. And it's much lighter mm. so you don't have issues with launch and fuel and all of that. The problem is, is that our machine can turn out maybe a gram a day, and oh. that's not nearly enough. So we are working with these other uh, entities and with some companies to try and figure out ways to make this go at a higher rate with this, retaining the quality. So in our office, we've had to deal with things like um, Space Act agreements with partners to do research on this and also material transfer agreements with uh, both domestic and international makers of other forms of boron nitride nanotubes where we trade their version for our version mm -hmm. to see, okay, what are you doing? Is the quality the same? Can you manufacture this stuff in sheets or not? And so far, nobody's been able to make it into sheets. We also have some other instruments out there with companies to try and make this uh, stuff um, in quantities that we can actually make use of. So those are a few examples of the kinds of things in the research and development area that the lawyers get involved with. And a lot of it is to help them to find an instrument or wording that will get them what they need within the confines of whatever the construct that, yeah. that they're going to work with, be it a contract or otherwise. It's kind of been the theme that we've been talking about, just how, as an attorney, your job is to encourage this innovation, but keep them legal, right? right. Keep and them in the box. Because we're not technically oriented, sometimes we come at it from a different angle yeah. than they do, and that's helpful. And that fresh perspective does help the R&D activities. Mm -hmm. Join us again next time, Between Two Fars.